We're going to do from Matthew 27, verse 54, all the way to the end of Matthew, all the way to 28, 20. Okay, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at a good chunk of verses. Uh, chapter 27 goes all the way to verse 66, and then it continues on to 28 after that. So we got a lot of verses to cover. It's going to be really dense, okay? It's really going to be dense. I don't mean dense as in doy. I mean dense as in a lot of information packed all at once. Okay, that's what we're going to be looking at. It's from 27, verse 54, all the way to the end of the Gospel of Matthew. And so, let's me pray for our time together, and we're going to kick into this. This is going to be special. It really is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to devote this time to studying your word. You have entrusted it to us, and we're so grateful for that. Lord, I ask for wisdom as we try to cut your word straight, as we try to handle it appropriately. And Lord, I ask that with the moving of your spirit, convict us. Convict us in ways that will help us to be challenged and in ways that will bring us to repentance and to a life better focused on you. Let's pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. Well, let's go ahead and start with this. We've already talked through Jesus' crucifixion. And by the way, I did not cover all of the elements of what's involved in the crucifixion process. Some of you were already grossed out by just what we covered last week in general. And there's so much more, so much more. So if you're of the curious academic type, you can see me and I'll be glad to, to share even further information that is available regarding what the crucifixion was like. So after Jesus had died on the cross, they took his body off of the cross, and now we get to talk about his burial. That's at chapter 27, verse 54, and it reads like this from the Holman Christian Standard Version. When it was evening, a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph came, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. He approached Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Then Pilate ordered it to be released. So Joseph took the body, wrapped it in clean, fine linen, and placed it in his new tomb, which he had cut into the rock. He left after rolling a great stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary who were seated there, no, that's not Jesus' mother. The other Mary were seated there, facing the tomb. The next day, which followed the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and they said, sir, we remember that while this deceiver was still alive, he said, after three days, I will rise again. Therefore, give orders that the tomb be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might come, steal him, and tell the people he has raised from the dead. Then the last deception will be worse than the first. You have a guard of soldiers, Pilate told them. Go and make it as secure as you know how. Then they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting the guard. Now, this is the burial part. Now, here's the thing. Little is known about Joseph of Arimathea. Little evidence is there. Little knowledge is there. What we do know is that this is a total shocking character for Matthew to talk about. Total shock. It goes against everything we, it, it almost, his existence almost goes against everything Jesus taught previously. Here's why. Jesus said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven, right? Here comes Joseph of Arimathea, who's rich and righteous. He is not what you would expect. Jesus spent so much time saying how hard it is for rich people to be godly, how it's almost impossible. It's not going to happen. And there's all this talk on poverty and poverty and poverty, all this talk on sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. And then Jesus dies. And I think Matthew includes Joseph Arimathea, includes this rich, righteous man to even show more of the shock that's happening here. Jesus is dead. The Messiah is dead. Is he really the Messiah then? And then what he always taught, rich people won't enter the kingdom of heaven, likely. The odds of that is great. That it's not going to happen. And suddenly, here's a rich, righteous man. Okay, it's just this real shock of a thing that happens. So Joseph of Arimathea shows up, and, uh, and he says, let me take the body and, and bury it. I bought a new tomb. He can go there. Okay, now, the Pharisees then went to Pilate, and what was their concern? That Jesus said that, we're going to rise again. So they're afraid that the disciples are going to come and steal the body, which, by the way, it is amazing how much high esteem, actually, the Pharisees viewed the disciples. 
I mean, if you think about it, that's giving them a lot of credit because the disciples are in no condition. They're afraid, they're scattered, they're powerless, leaderless, they're broken, they're, they're in a heavy, dark, hopeless place, and they're going to be in the right mind to go plan a stealing of a body? Really? That's really giving them a lot of credit here, okay? But nevertheless, the Pharisees are concerned. So they're like, you know, someone may steal the body. We got to get this ready. So Pilate's like, fine, go ahead. Super glue and caulk the stone, <laughs> okay? Put some good caulk around it and, and build a little fence around it and put some guards all around it to make sure it's not going to happen. Since it's in the side of a mountain, you're not going to go from the other side. It's not like there's a back door to mountains these days. You know, this isn't, you know, Middle Earth. Th this is uh, simply <laughs> uh, a, a normal mountain here, okay, with just one entrance into this cave. So that's the setting. Jesus is buried. He's in the ground. It's sealed. It's locked. A big stone. There's cement, if you will. Whatever it takes to seal it. It's airtight. Okay, so that's what's happening here. That's what it is. There's guards sitting all around it. Then this happens. Jesus' resurrection, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, not Jesus' mother, we'll talk about that here in a moment, and the other Mary went in to view the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. And he rolled back the stone and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his robe was as white as snow. The guards were so shaken from fear of him that they became like dead men so afraid that they just froze. But the angel told the women, don't be afraid, because I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been resurrected just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead. In fact, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. Listen, I have told you. So departing quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, with great hope, they ran to tell his disciples the news. En route, just then, Jesus met them and said, good morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is funny to me. They're like, oh my gosh, this is scary. This is freaky. Then Jesus shows up and goes, morning. You know, I just, I love that. Good morning. They came up took hold of his feet, okay, they just fell on the ground, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus told them, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers to leave for Galilee, and they will see me there. Here's what's going on here in this situation. Everything is hopeless, everything is dark, the leader, Jesus, is dead, he's in the grave, he's in the tomb, and then the two Marys show up, and their goal is to view the tomb. Okay, basically this is preparing to, you know, make it ready for what you do to grave sites. You know, you put flowers on it and you put uh, little, little trinkets and memories of the per person's life around it. And you decorate it, you make it nice, different little things along those lines. Okay, so they're going there to begin to do those types of process. And here's the weird thing about it is that there's two Marys that are there. Now, when you look at all the Gospels, all four of them, and you see the picture in its entirety. It appears to be at least three women are there. Um, we don't, it's what appears to be. We know for sure two, because Matthew says two, and that both of them are named Mary. Which Marys? First one's Mary Magdalene. Okay, this is the one that had the, uh, the seven demons in her when she met Jesus, okay, and Jesus casted them out. Okay, that's Mary Magdalene. And then you have the other Mary, this is not Jesus' mother, Mary. This is Mary, the mother of the Apostle James, Mary. That's who this Mary is, the mother of the Apostle James. The Apostle James is not the author of the book of James, by the way, because James gets killed, and then Jesus' brother, James, whose mom is also Mary, writes the book of James. <laughs> Confused? Okay, different James, but they're, not, they're different brothers from a different mother. Okay, that, that's what... Merry Christmas. <laughs> That's just, a, it's a little confusing. So you got Mary Magdalene, Mary the son of the apostle James, and then you got Mary, who, no, Mary the son of, Mary who had the son named, uh, who was the apostle James, then you got the third Mary, who was the mother of Jesus, James, and Jude. 
Okay, and so Jesus, obviously the son of God, James, who ends up becoming a leader in the church and writes uh, the book of James, and then he thinks Jude should do the same thing, so he goes to Jude and yells, hey, Jude! Come on! <laughs> You ought to write a book of the Bible, too. So Jude writes Jude, and that's where we get from that. But things worth noting here about these two Marys that are at the tomb. One, Jesus' mom is not there. Notice that. Jesus' mom is not going to the grave. In fact, Jesus' mom is not mentioned in the narrative of the Gospels until Pentecost in the book of Acts. She is in the upper room with the disciples waiting for the Spirit to come rushing in, okay, five days after, after um, the, the Sabbath and after everything has happened, five days after Passover, okay, Pentecost. So it, it, it's, it's that, that's what is happening there. And so, but, but Mary's at that point. She's an axe, but she is not at the tomb. Mary Magdalene and James' mother, Mary is there, but not Jesus' mother. That's interesting. And of those two Marys that are there, notice something else. Mary Magdalene, single. Mary, mother of James, mother, possibly Mary. I think it's interesting that we see the two women that come to the tomb that Matthew records that he emphasizes you got a single woman and you got a married woman with a kid. You got a, a motherless woman and a mothered woman. It's interesting the scope that's grasped on that the inclusion of those women like that, that is there. We're going to talk more about this in a moment, but you just need to see more of the narrative on what's taking place here, okay? So let's just kind of see what happens next. Okay, so they're there at the tomb. It is empty. The angel rolled away the tomb because it takes an angel to do it because it's sealed. Okay, and not only was it rolled there to guard it, but then it was sealed on top of that. So it takes supernatural involvement to break all of this, and the guards are freaked out. So then... Mary and Mary leave. They meet Jesus on the road on the way out. Kind of cool. They're the first ones Jesus appears to. Okay, are these two women? I didn't think it's intriguing too. Meanwhile, the story takes us back now to the guards that were there at the tomb. Once that they left and everything's gone, the guards are like, oh. you know, I almost picture like a Bugs Bunny moment. You know, and they're just kind of freaking out, stuttering. It's just really shocking moment. And here's what ends up happening. Okay, as they were on their way, some of the guards came into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. Okay, everything that had happened. Angels, Mary, everything. After the priests had assembled with the elders and agreed on a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, and they told them, say this, his disciples came during the night and stole him while we were sleeping. If this news reaches the governor's ears, we will deal with him and keep you out of trouble. So if you end up being viewed as being sloughing off on the job, We'll take care of it. We will deal with the governor, and you will not get arrested. You will not get punished, demoted, etc. Okay, so they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been spread among Jewish people to this day. That is to the date of when Matthew is writing, around 58, 59 A.D. Okay, so late 50s, late 6th century of... Yeah, late, late... Well, 50-some A.D., this late mid-first century. Sorry, I had to get my numbers there. Late first, mid, middle first century, about 58, 59 A.D. Okay, so that's where the, this is still happening, and this lie is still being spread. Now, with this lie, there's irony here, isn't there? Because the guards who were sent to do what purpose? To protect from the lie of stealing are now the first evangelists of the resurrection and are now in charge with spreading the lie they were, supposed to protect, they were supposed to protect from in the first place. Now they're the ones spreading the lie. See, that's just, there's irony there in that. There's just great irony. Okay, so this lie is now being spread about the resurrection. And by the way, I just want to point out that the, this, the lie of the, of the falsehood of the resurrection still continues on today. Because Jesus did raise again from the dead, but the world still wants to say that he did not raise from the dead. Okay, that, that lie still even continues on. And so what I would like to do is take a moment and share with you proofs of the resurrection of Christ. 
Okay, I'd like to share with you, now these are circumstantial proofs. Okay, I say circumstantial because you cannot have scientific evidence of Jesus' resurrection because there's no body. No body, no evidence. Okay, which almost in itself evidence. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, you don't have a body. You can't retest and get another result. You can't test, get results, retest, get results. That's what scientific proof needs. This is why stuff like evolution can never go beyond that of a theory or even creation for that matter because you can't retest the origins. It only happens once, and you've you got to have just theory about it according to the scientific model. So we cannot scientifically prove what has taken place with the resurrection. What we can do is circumstantially prove it. Isn't that fun? Okay, now there are like, I don't know, 12, 13 different circumstantial evidences of the resurrection that are really hard, tight-knit issues. I'm going to share with you just the ones relevant to the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, that's about four. Okay, so we're going to go through four. We're going to go through three now, and I'm going to save the fourth one for the end of the sermon just because it's fun. Okay, so if you, if you want everything all knit together in your notes, leave a gap after number three for the fourth one to kind of fit in there. Okay, um, but we're going to go through four total of circumstantial evidences regarding the resurrection of Christ. And I want you to, to, to see this here, okay, and, and know this, because we as followers of Christ are not called to be empty-headed. We're called to be knowledgeable and understanding. So I'm going to show you some great pictures and graphs. Maybe if our, our video guy is really rambunctious and wants to slide the camera to the screen, if he can, that, that would be cool to, so the people online can see these pictures. Otherwise, the information I give you, you can Google it, and you'll see the pictures that I'm showing. They're very much well-known and well-available. So some of the proofs, the circumstantial proofs regarding the resurrection of Jesus. Number one is that Women went to the tomb. Uh, you're like, what? How is that proof of anything? Number one, women went to the tomb. Here's the thing. If you're going to make a lie, and you want it to spread, and you want it to hold weight, in that culture, you would not use women because women cannot testify in court. If you were going to make a lie, you would make sure there were men there that it was men who talked to the angel, that it was men who were the ones that were there first. That's what you would make sure on, okay? If you were going to tell a lie, you'd want to convince men to do the lying. In fact, who was it that Pilate paid off to spread the lie about the body being stolen in the first place? Was it a couple of women? Or did Pilate bribe men? Okay, because that's what you'd want to do. So the honesty of the text is say, hey, just women were there. I know it won't hold up in the court of law because the women can't give that type of testifying, but we're not going to fake this. We're going to give this as it was. Women were involved. Okay, so that's number one there. Number two, which is also just really kind of fun, is that enemies believe Jesus rose. Okay, Jesus' enemies believed it. As my wife so greatly pointed out to me the other day when we were going through the notes and she's censoring things. You'll see why. Um, and, and, you know, but we're talking about it. She goes, well, ha, those were men. It's like, yeah, they were men, but they were enemies. <laughs> okay. These were Jesus' enemies that were there that believed Jesus rose. Okay. That, that's something special when your enemies believe it. When the guards set to protect from the lie are the evangelists of the event. Okay, they're the ones saying this happened. Okay, so that's another big issue right there. Here's one of the biggest ones, and I, I, I'm going to plant my flag here for a while. Okay, that there was absolutely no shrine built. There was no shrine built at Jesus' grave. In Jewish culture, Greek culture, Roman culture, American culture, a couple thousand years later, we build shrines on people's graves. Okay, first we usually put a tombstone, and it's usually pretty, right? Uh, some sort. It's usually not just some rock that we just carve something into and shove it on the ground. Usually we do what with it? We make it look nice. It's usually a round or it's perfect squared, and it's on a plot, and it's lawn covered, and it's, and it's mowed. And what do we put around the grave? We put flowers and maybe a picture and maybe a phrase on it. Here lies so-and-so, and we make it real nice. And now what they're starting to develop are tombstones that have a um, uh, solar-powered TV in them that will play when you walk up to it. It's motion-censored and will play a video, a slideshow of the person's life of whom's grave you're standing on. 
which would be really interesting, you know? Maybe it could even be, you, if you want to record a video yourself, you put that into the tombstone, and then someone come up and go, I miss you, and you pop on and you go, hi there, like, ah! You, know, <laughs> you could have a lot of fun with that, but we make a shrine to it. Back then, they put flowers, and they put trinkets, and they put all these, and people would gather, and they would wail, and they would do all of that. And this is what happened to all these grave sites all across history, not Jesus's. Jesus had no shrine, no flowers, no trinkets, no nothing. Why? Because he wasn't there. He wasn't there. In fact, if you go to Israel today and you take the Jesus tour, okay, there are multiple types of Jesus tours. What's funny is if you take certain Jesus tours, they'll take you where Jesus went and where he walked, and different tours will take you to different locations for the same event. <laughs> Okay, because they, they have what's called the tourist event, then they have the real event, and that is not very pretty. And, and so it's the, the tourist events are close by, so it's not like they're deceiving you. It just this is more accessible, it can handle the crowds better. But really, Jesus was like over there and around the corner in that alley. <laughs> okay, that's where it was at. But, but we're gonna put it here because it's still in route and it's still there, and we can handle the thousands of people here. But when you take the tour, and you go, and I've seen this online, I've seen tours, I've talked to professors that have been on the tour, I hope one day to, to maybe even go on the tour just so I could be able to get first-hand event on this weird little phenomena, and that is that when you, they say, here's the tomb, this is like the tomb Jesus was buried in. Hear that phrase? It's like the tomb. Well, well where is Jesus' tomb exactly? Their answer? We don't know. They don't know. They said, this, this, this could be this tomb. It's in the right area, but it, it could also be that tomb up over there on top of the hill. It could be over there. That could be the tomb that Joseph bought. We really don't know. If there's a third site that's currently under excavation, and maybe it might be that tomb. We're not completely sure. What we do know is that it would have been like this tomb, so we use this tomb. Why is it that all these years we don't know where Jesus' tomb is? Because nobody ever went there. Jesus rose again, and everybody followed Jesus. Nobody went to the spot where Jesus lived, or where he died, I mean. Nobody went there. And if you don't go there, you don't know where it is. And throughout history, nobody knows where Jesus' tomb is, because nobody ever went there, because they were following a risen Lord, not a dead Lord. Okay, so nobody went to Jesus' body, to where his body was laid. They just didn't go there. In fact, this is what makes Christianity totally unique, is this whole element of this resurrection. This is what makes us completely unique. Because here's the thing, when you look at Judaism, okay, Judaism, you can go over to Israel, you can go to the cave of the patriarchs. This is where Abraham is buried. And they also have Isaac and Jacob there. Okay, so people know where Abraham is buried. And so Ju in Judaism, people would, some of them, some of the Jews will do pilgrimages there. And they'll walk over to this site there and they'll go to the cave of the patriarchs and they will weep and they will mourn and they will, you know, grieve over the loss of their dead leader. Okay, now if you want, you could go over to Kandy, India, and there you could find the tomb of Buddha, the original Buddha that, that died. Okay, now I know they have different inc in, um, uh, incarnation things and whatnot, but this is Buddha's tomb. It's the tomb of the tooth, they call it, because really they had his body di di uh, split in pieces and they buried him in different places. You got different tombs for Buddha, different places because of his body being dissected. But this is the, the biggest one, the most famous one, is in Kandy, India. It's Buddha's tomb, and it's the tomb of the tooth. That's where his teeth were buried. <laughs> and so you, people, uh, Buddhists, will go there and they will grieve and mourn and wail and weep over the death of their leader. And they wish that the, the full Buddha would be able to come back and hasn't. Yeah, they got different people they call the Buddha, but it's not the Buddha like this. So they make this pilgrimage yearly to see Buddha. Or they can go to um, Medina, Saudi Arabia, and they can go to Muhammad's tomb. This is where Muslims can go and do go. This is the second most important place for Muslims to go uh, uh, other than the pilgrimage to Mecca. Okay, so they can go over here to Medina and they can see Muhammad's tomb. Go inside this building, it's underneath the green dome. That's where Muhammad's tomb is. And they go and they weep and they mourn the great prophet Muhammad. Uh, for those that are into uh, Confucianism, Confucius's tomb is in Khufu, China. You can go there and you can see Confucius' tomb. And some people do make this type of a pilgrimage. And they go and they weep and they mourn and they cry uh, over their leader who's dead. 
Okay, so here's some basic little questions for you then. Who's buried in Abraham's tomb? Abraham. Who's buried in Buddha's tomb? Buddha. Who's buried in, in uh, Muhammad's tomb? Muhammad. Who's buried in Confucius's tomb? Confucius. Who's buried in Jesus's tomb? Nobody. Okay, nobody. That's why we don't have an event like this or a building like this for Jesus's tomb. These are, these are some of the biggest, most common of the world religions here, okay? Muslim, Judaism, Buddhism are the three biggies. Taoism, Rastafarianism, Zoroastrianism, Confucianism, Taoism, all of them, all their leaders have graves with beautiful little shrines all around them because they're all dead. Christianity does not have that because nobody's in the grave. The grave is empty. We're, we're not Buddhists, we're not Muslims, we're not Judaizers or Jews, we're not Confucians, we're, we're Christians. And our grave is empty. And we serve a risen leader. Okay, that's, what we, that's why this whole idea of not having a shrine is so huge that no one ever built it in the history of the past 2,000 years. No one's built it. No one knows where it would be because we have a risen leader. Our tomb is empty. Okay, that is what is so awesome about Christianity. That is what's so amazing about it. That's why we're not a, a religion that's founded on some type of philosophy. We're founded on the Son of God, the triune God of the Bible, and a risen Lord. That's what we're founded upon. That's what makes Christianity completely unique. A completely unique. Jesus, this whole story continues on. So after the guards have been told to tell the lie, Jesus is risen from the dead, but they're told that he got stolen. We know that Jesus rose from the dead. The 11 disciples traveled to Galilee, just as the two Marys told them to do. The, two, the, the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. I love the fact they have to go to a mountain. All throughout the book of Matthew, you have constantly the painting of Moses, God, Israel metaphors all throughout it. And it's neat that at the end, when Jesus gives them the last command, we get again Jesus on the mountain. Who is it that always appeared to Israel on the mountain? God. Who is Jesus? God. Is Matthew again pointing the divinity of Jesus because they're going to the mountain just like Israel would do throughout the Old Testament to God the Father. So now Jesus is on top of this mountain and he's going to teach them a last commandment. A last commandment. So when they saw him, they worshipped but some of them doubted. Isn't that interesting? The 11 disciples are there. We don't know how many. We don't know how the division was. We don't know if it was six and five or 10 and, or, or if it was nine and two. We do know that it was not 10 and one because some doubted. One is not some. One is one. And Matthew would be real quick to point that out. You know, all of them worship Jesus, but, but Thomas. <laughs> not that it would be him, but, but Thomas. <laughs> you know? And so it, it would point that out. But here Matthew is showing that multiple disciples doubted. This is important to know. First off, this word doubt is actually the exact same Greek word that is used to describe Peter when he was walking on the water and fell in. And Jesus said, oh, you of little, little faith. Okay, same word. Just in this type of context, to say that some worshiped him and some had little faith is a little odd. So we translate it as doubted. Okay, but it basically some showed up and they had great faith and they worshiped Jesus. Some are showing up and they see Jesus and they go, I'm disturbed. This can't be him. I'm not sure. I have doubt. I'm struggling with this. I'm not sure who I'm looking at here. And this is important because this is the best and most important evidence against the mass hallucination theory. Have you ever heard the mass hallucination theory where everybody hallucinated that Jesus risen rose from the dead? Okay, well, here's the thing. If you are having a hallucination, you always believe it to be true. In fact, it is almost impossible to get a person to believe against their hallucination. It has to wait till the hallucination is over before you can really get them to think rationally again. 
Okay, so if it was a mass hallucination, everyone would be believing immediately when it had to be convinced otherwise. Here we have some that doubted, which means they were not hallucinating or they would not be in the right mind to be able to have a question there. Hallucinations don't tend to be questioned. Okay, so they're looking at Jesus and some doubted. Some doubted. And we might want to be quick to slam on the disciples. Man, you guys have lived. Why, why couldn't they? He's right before them. Why couldn't they just believe? Well, how many of us struggle with belief? Oh, sure, we agree with the set of facts, but how many of us really struggle with that life change conviction? Or how many of us go back into little sins, or even big sins in some cases, almost on an addictive level, over and over and over again? And those, every time a person sins, there's an element of doubt because you're saying, I don't know if Jesus' way is the best way. So I'm going to choose my way. My way of pride, my way of of sexual sin, my way of thievery, my way of arrogance, my way of cussing and control, and my way of manipulation, my way of neglect, my way of self-centeredness, my way of complaining and gossiping, and on and on. Every time we have sin in our life, it means there's a little bit of doubt that's still there. Because we're wondering, is Jesus' way really the best? And so we all have doubt issues from time to time. And the disciples are just like us. They had some doubt issues. They struggled with it. They're not perfect. And they struggled with the appearance of Jesus that was there. So some worshiped, some doubted. Story continues on. Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. That puts us at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, some big questions have come up regarding this great commission. It is of great debate, this mission commission, as I would like to call it. Okay, this has been of great debate. Is this command for only the 11 disciples? That's the question. Because here's the thing that has been coming up. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. Therefore, and he's talking to whom? The 11 disciples. And he says, I am telling you, go therefore into all nations, you know, and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to be obedient to the Bible. Okay, and so they're noticing, people are noticing that Jesus is talking to the 11 disciples. So therefore, they have come to the conclusion, some scholars have, in stating that, therefore, the mission commission really is not something churches today should be all centered on, and this is for those 11 disciples only. And when they died, the mission commission was over, as well as the canon of scripture being closed, and all that got sealed up, and it's done, and it's over with now. All we got left is teaching people to be obedient, okay? And then that's the focus of of the church. In fact, many churches have that as their existence. They're a teaching church. You go there to, you know, to to learn and, and, and to be challenged, to be better parents, better employees, whatever, basically read or digest, except with some Bible thrown into it. And then if the church gets big enough, they can financially help poor people and struggling people, et cetera, et cetera. And that becomes the existence of the church. Does that sound like a lot of churches in our city today? And so the question is, is this view, is this mission commission only for the 11 disciples? And I would like to challenge that that view is wrong. That there is ample evidence for the mission commission being able to be carried on to every follower of Christ beyond the 11. That there is actual textual evidence in Jesus' words making it clear This is not for the 11 disciples only. That he is talking to the 11 disciples and it goes on beyond them. Ample evidence. Would you like some? Good. I'm glad some of you are on board. Ample evidence number one. I'm trying to remember if I actually have a uh, do not. So we're just going to talk about it together here. Number one. Let's look at what Jesus said. Let me back this up a little bit here. Let's look at what Jesus said. 
He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. Okay? The rest of this, this, this we know fairly well. If you're in church for a long period of time, especially in a Baptist church or a Southern Baptist church, you're going to know this verse. Okay? You're going to know this verse, verse, verse 18, right? You're going to know this, 18 and 19 here. But here's the part that tends to be ignored or forgotten, that after you've gone to all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Okay, to teach them to observe everything I have commanded whom? Okay, so everything Jesus commanded the 11. The 11 are to tell them, the other disciples, to observe. Teach them to observe. Teach them to follow. Teach them to obey everything I am telling you. So yes, he's talking directly to the 11, and he is telling the 11, every person that you make a disciple of, tell them to do the same thing. Everything I'm teaching you, tell them to follow. Tell them to obey. And how long does this last until? What's Jesus' focus? He says, when you're doing this, I am with you. All the way until... Till he returns. Okay, so as the 11 make disciples, the old new disciples are to be commanded to observe everything Jesus taught, including making disciples. And as those disciples make disciples, those other disciples are supposed to be taught to obey everything Jesus commanded, including making disciples. And you keep that process going until Jesus returns. The Mission Commission continues all the way until Jesus himself absolutely returns, which means then that discipleship is replication. A disciple of Christ will reproduce themselves, and that's not sexually. Okay? That is about replication. A disciple will make disciples. That's how that functions. That's how that works. In fact, Dr. Wilder of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, my academic advisor, and I've had him for several courses, made this very bold statement. If a disciple is not making disciples, they are not a disciple. They are lying to themselves and everybody else. If they are not making disciples, then they are not obeying Jesus, his command. And if they're not obeying Jesus' command, they are not following him, and therefore they're not making disciples. Okay, so that the purpose of discipleship is replication. And in case you want to know how all this is even works and what discipleship is even about, discipleship, I believe, is beautifully defined in Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, which says this, that we proclaim him, Jesus, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Okay, this is the purpose of discipleship, that we teach and we proclaim. We teach Jesus, we proclaim Jesus, we teach his word, we proclaim his word with all wisdom, with the entire Bible, that we may help people come to Jesus and become mature in him. That's discipleship. And all Followers of Jesus, if they are going to be a follower of Jesus, must be involved on this. Must be involved in making disciples. Must be involved in proclaiming and teaching everyone with wisdom about Jesus. Helping everyone become mature in Jesus. That is what the Mission Commission is about. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is your life goal. This is your purpose. This is your aim. This is your direction. This is what this is about. And I fear that the churches of today have lost disciple-making. They're all about academics. They're all about entertainment. They're all about production. They're about helping poor people, which is awesome, and also part of Scripture. But it's like we've lost that evangelistic edge. We've lost that purpose of proclaiming Jesus and helping people mature in Christ. We've lost that part. It's almost like, and this is going to be the analogy I'm going to use for you, it's almost like we've all become, that the church of today has become like a football game. Okay, we've, we've become like a football game, kind of like the next Super Bowl, 
right? That's going to be coming up here in just a little bit, which I'm guessing is going to be, uh, I don't know the stats from this weekend because this weekend's not completed yet. I'm guessing it's going to be probably the Seahawks versus the Broncos. You know, I think, as, would you agree with me, Brandon? Okay, he's, he's on with me. He's like, yeah, Seahawks and Broncos, absolutely. You know, I, they have the best record statistically. They're the strongest teams. They have the highest likely of making that the Super Bowl game. Though I, it is possible the Bengals and 49ers could make an upset. And if the Bengals and 49ers made that upset, that would be really cool because that would be like a revisit to the classic Super Bowl 23 game. And that would be just really fun for the fans. Now, I know some of you are like, what the heck? Okay, Brandon's happy. He's like, oh, I didn't think of that. That's cool. You know, <laughs> you know but Rush, you're like, and especially if you know me, you're like, where the heck did you pull that out of? You know, uh, where, where did that come from? How did you pull that out of your hindquarter? Because if you know me, I am not a sports guy. I know squat about stats. Okay, I had to read a dozen football Super Bowl prediction commentaries from the experts in the field and piece it all together to give you that little bit that I gave you because it was fun. <laughs> but here's the thing. This is what people are like in the church, though. They're fans. They're not players. They're fans of the game. Okay, they, they're, they're like soup football fans. They, they'll sit in the bleachers or they'll watch it on TV and some will be very religious about it. I got season tickets. I'm gonna go every time they're home. And if I can schedule my vacation around the away games, I'll be there. And I'm gonna dress with their name on my jersey and I'm gonna have PJs with my favorite player on it. You know, and I'm gonna just be all about them. And I'm gonna have little trading cards even and collect the little football cards or baseball cards or whatever. And, and I'm gonna go to different, card conventions and I want to be able to trade and, and they become very religious about it and then they get excited because they can throw a, like, a, like a football party uh, maybe even their own Super Bowl party and they get excited because more people attended than last year and if fewer people attend and then they say well they justify it. well you know it was more homey and I liked it and this was fun you know it was more intimate and personal this way but they're not players they're fans they're fans. And regardless of the fandom dedication that you have, regardless of how insincere you are about being a fan, regardless about how emphatic and dedicated you are, you're always going to be a fan and nothing changes in your life. After a game is done, you go home, life is business as usual. That's what happens with fans. Okay, they attend a game, they watch the game, and they go home, and they go to bed, they wake up in the morning, life as usual, business as usual, no change. Nothing's different. Week in, week out, nothing changes. There is no growth. There is no development. There's no recruiting because you're not on the field. You're not a player and you're not recruiting other players. You're just a fan. Okay, and we have to ask ourselves, what are you in the kingdom of Christ? Are you a player or a fan? And we have to be very careful with that answer because it could just be that only those with Jesus jerseys is going into the kingdom that fans may not be allowed in because they've not really repented to join the team. Let me ask you, are fans really members of the team? No, they're not. It's a very serious issue. Has there been that type of repentance in your life that you said, my life is not about me, my life is about the kingdom of Christ, my life is about doing this? This is how we transition from fan to player is that we start proclaiming Jesus. We start living for Jesus. We start warning and teaching whom? Everyone that we come in contact with. Everyone. With all wisdom. Okay, which means we got to be growing in our knowledge. But you don't wait until you've gotten to be wisdomous. Okay? All the people that have come across Jesus in the Bible 
once they became a disciple of Christ, how long did they wait before they started telling other people about Jesus? Five minutes at best. Once Jesus touched their life, their life became changed, they immediately went. They didn't go to school. They didn't get a lot of education. They immediately went and started telling about Jesus. They did not wait a minute on it. Okay, Matthew, when he became a follower of Jesus, how long did it take for him to start doing something to do Colossians 128? As far as we know, he left Jesus, grabbed his cell phone, and made a party. And got everybody over because Jesus went and attended that party. Okay, so you don't have to wait until you've become all wisdomous. But we are supposed to grow in our wisdom, grow in our understanding. Much like a player of a game will constantly grow in their skill, constantly grow in their muscle development, constantly grow and practice and work at it, okay? And then when they get so old, like in football, when you get so old, like, you know, 39, <laughs> that you can't play anymore, not in the same way, do they, you know, of a really true player of the game will then go involved in helping train other people to play better. They will then go and they'll get it, they'll still be worked. They may not be running the field, but they haven't left the field. You know what I mean? They're still playing it. Those are the true players. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we players for Jesus or fans of Jesus? If somebody looked at your life, would they see evidence of a resurrected Messiah? Because here's the fourth evidence of the proof of the resurrection of Jesus. What were the disciples like before Jesus resurrected? What were they like? They were cowards. They ran, they scattered, little faith, constant, constant. Even when Jesus had just resurrected, they still struggled with it. What were they like afterwards? They all died for their faith. Their lives were changed. Peter, who wouldn't tell anyone about Jesus publicly, not only wrote books of the Bible, but was even crucified for his faith and unrelentingly confessed. Everyone who scattered when Jesus was arrested held their ground when opposition came their way concerning Jesus. Their lives changed. They went from self-serving, self-centered to self-sacrificing committed followers. Their lives changed. A dramatic, amazing change. All throughout our movies, our literature, and all throughout counseling and psychology, people say, when well, people don't change. It would be a miracle if somebody changed. And the resurrection changes people. And it's a miracle every time. Is your life evidence of a resurrected Messiah? Or are you a fan sitting on the bleachers with the little flag, rah, rah, Jesus, rah, rah. How is your life described? I want to challenge you to embrace the mission commission and go and proclaim Jesus, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Let's have a word of prayer.